I like the word indeed. I get some flack for it. You know, people say, did you call me? I say, indeed. But this is one day I don't have to, you know, feel funny about the word indeed. Um, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you. I love to hear that. I love it. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Amen. Today we celebrate that Christ is risen and is seated at the right hand of God. That's the phrase used in your Colossians passage where we will be. That's on page four of your liturgy that we already read. Christ is absolutely free. He is absolutely free. And we are united with Christ, which means we are free. Christ is free. We are united with Christ. And so we are free. In uh, one of his books on contemplative prayer, the Englishman Martin Laird uh, talks about walks he used to take during the day, and he would always see a man walking his um, four Kerry Blue Terriers um, on this walk. And, you know, Terriers, if you know them, they just, they're land, that's what terra, Terrier means, they're land creatures, they just love running across the land and, and digging, and, and he would see this guy, and, the, and he'd, they'd be off-leash, and these Terriers would just be flying through the countryside where Martin Laird lived, and... Uh, but he said, you know, every time he'd see that one of these terriers, the same one, wouldn't bound across the landscape like the rest, but would actually run in these tight little circles, just as energetically, but in these tight little circles. And so one day he asked the man, you know, what's with this one little dog? And the man said, well, you know, its previous owner kept him in a cage a lot. And so he learned to exercise just within the bounds of that cage. And you know, that really strikes me as a helpful image for today as we reflect on Jesus' resurrection, as we reflect on his emergence from the tomb, that cage, and what that means for us as well. There's a lot in these four verses from Colossians 3, but I want to consider three Easter truths again that we see there, and they are again. The first is that as a result of Jesus' resurrection, he is absolutely free. He has victory over death, and he has returned to a place of absolute freedom at the right hand of the Father. The second, as I said, is this, that we are united with him. We have been baptized into his death and raised with him. Where he is, in a sense, we are, and where we are, he is. And the third, that again, if Jesus is free and we're united with him, then we are free. What does that mean? for us. Well, first, Jesus is absolutely free. Of course, he was always free. Before Jesus was Jesus, he was called the Word. And in the very first verses of John's Gospel, we are told that this Word, in his absolute freedom, created the world. In the beginning, says John, was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So the person we know as Jesus was present as the word at creation, and he translated the Godhead's loving will into a world of nature and people and life, into mind-blowing diversity, as biologists can tell you, or botanists. Jesus was the co-creator of the world. He was kind of the the painter and the sculpture to the God's head's idea of creating a world and a people who would fellowship with God. These flowers here this morning, those are his. And Paul adds in this letter to the Colossians elsewhere, not only were all things made through him, but he actually holds all things together. If God were to withdraw his breath, everything would just evaporate. He is the creating and sustaining light and life of the world. He has always been completely free. In our passage today, though, the freedom of the word, we know, became incarnate. Jesus, as the word, gave up some of his freedoms, not just to die as a man, but to show us how to live, to show us how to live by the spirit. He didn't just come to die. He he could have just let Herod kill him as a baby. No, he came to live giving up some of his freedoms to show us how we might live by the Spirit. He was conceived by the Spirit, and he was raised by the Spirit. He did die, 
but raised he was. And Colossians tells us in first verse of this chapter that the resurrected Christ is now seated at the right hand of God. Of course, to be at the right hand is to be at a place of power, authority, and strength. And we see this phrase throughout Scripture where it's used. And where it's used, it's actually a particular kind of power. And it's the power to save. We heard this in our psalm today, right? Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous, of salvation. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live. The right hand of the Lord is the saving hand in its complete freedom. Jesus, as the right hand of God, is moving in full freedom toward the restoration of this world. As Paul says in Romans 6 9, Christ being raised from the dead is never going to die again. This is kind of the final state of things, if you will, with regard to Christ. He is and will always be at the right hand of God, moving and restoring the world. And not only that, but following his resurrection, the Spirit was going to be or was set loose to inhabit the hearts of those who believed in Jesus, what we'll celebrate as Pentecost in a few weeks. So throughout Scripture, the resurrection and the giving of the Spirit are actually very closely connected. Joel 2.28 prophesies this. I'm going to pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Later today, we will witness a baptism. Dennis is going to pour water over Asher's head, signifying in part that the spirit of God has been poured out on Asher's life. And Jesus speaks to this right in the upper room. We celebrate it on Thursday, John 14. He tells his very nervous disciples, I'm going to speak to the Father. And he'll provide you another friend so that you will always have someone with you. And that's the Spirit. Later, he says to them in this way, it's to your advantage that I go away. And the apostles are thinking, how could this, disciples are thinking, how could this possibly be to my advantage? For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit won't come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. We are Holy Trinity Church. And uh, this icon here and here is the icon of the Holy Trinity, painted for us 600 years before we existed. Isn't that good? That was a little joke. That was funny in my head. But, um, no, it wasn't painted for us. It's painted by Andrei Rublev, a Russian icon painter in the 15th century. And what he does is he captures exactly this moment when the resurrected Jesus, who is in the middle, wearing the kind of uh, burgundy, uh, both of his blood and that earthy color, is asking the Father to your left if he will now send the Spirit whose head is bowed and ready to go. Ready to go where the Father sends him. So the resurrection and the giving of the Spirit are part of the power of the right hand of God to save. Now you notice that in the coming of the Spirit, not everything changed instantly in the world as a result. The will that God gave people can still resist God for a while. And that clash of wills in this world can cause a lot of chaos. Any parent will know this, right? We have a loving will for our children that they often resist. When we try to get them to eat this or go to bed at this time, and that clash of wills can create chaos transpose that to the world of adults where the resistance of the right hand of God of the true, the good, and the beautiful can cause real harm and disruption in our world. So we are in the already and not yet. The right hand of God is moving and restoring and saving and there is resistance and it sometimes looks as chaos but all the power and all the freedom remains in the right hand of God with Jesus. The arc of history is bending and will move toward the restoration of all things because Jesus is completely free and at the right hand of God. So the first thing is that Jesus has absolute freedom by the Spirit to conquer death and outlast and overcome the chaos of death. And the important thing for us is this, that those who believe in Jesus who have received the Spirit are united with him. And of course, that's the second thing. You and I are united with Jesus. Jesus is free, and by the Spirit, we are in union with him. The scriptures have all kinds of ways of talking about this union with God. On Thursday night, again, 
we celebrated the Lord's Supper. And he says to the disciples, on that day, referring to the day when the Holy Spirit would be poured out, you will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This kind of theological pretzel. You will know that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. In the next chapter, he gives them an image of this union. I am the vine, you are the branches. Paul puts it another way. I no longer, it is not I who any longer live, but Christ lives in me. And in our passage in Colossians 3, we see this union put this way. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. You have been raised with Christ. Second Peter puts it this way. His divine power has granted all things that you may become partakers of the divine nature. But Colossians, again, puts this union union appropriately for today in terms of baptism. In Romans 6, 4, Paul says it another way. We have been baptized with him by baptism into his death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, so we too might walk in newness of life. So what does it mean to have died with Christ or to have been baptized into his death? Well, to be baptized into his death means that our death will not be one that has suffered alone. That our death will not be final because in a sense we are dying with Jesus that is a very different kind of death in the words of our theme it is the sepulchral or grave that is actually a womb leading to life but to die and be raised with Christ doesn't just address physical death because Paul in Ephesians 2 1 says you actually before you knew Christ were dead in your transgressions and sins We were, prior to our conversions, whenever we marked that, however we marked that, we were living cut off from the source of life. And we found and clung to Christ because we sensed that somehow we were not living life. The word coming to be incarnated in Jesus joined us in this not really life when he became human. Joined us in this life where, like that terrier, we had found ourselves running in circles. Last week I mentioned, doesn't it seem like there's so much cultural activity, so many things happening, so much, uh, so many scandals, so much stuff, and we run round and round, and it seems like nothing's changing. Jesus joined us in that kind of life of circles. You know, life without God might have seemed for us like riding a roller coaster that we can't get off. And for those of us who have motion sickness, that would be hell. But to be baptized into Jesus' death is to actually realize that Jesus has come on to the roller coaster and sat next to us in this sometimes chaotic, sometimes up and down, sometimes upside down journey. But because he got on the roller coaster, he knows how to get off. To die with Jesus is to die with with someone who knows how to get off that kind of life. Baptism is a going down into the chaos of the waters of life, but in emerging from it. Our passage in Colossians begins with this truth. You have been raised with Christ. We have been baptized into the not final death of Christ and have been raised with him because we are in union with him. And this leads us to the third thing. If Jesus now lives in freedom and we are in union with Jesus, then we are also free. Jesus' resurrection, by the way, was not just for his body and freedom, but for ours. We will be free, but not just from the physical death as the final cage, but free from running in the tight little circles of life that seems to often go nowhere apart from Jesus. As Paul says, what we've been raised into is newness of life, a different way of living. And this freedom is stated plainly in 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, what? There is freedom. Still, this is a union with Christ and a freedom in Christ that we have to step out into. For like that one terrier, we sometimes still think we're in that same cage because we've been trained to run in those same circles all our lives when in fact we need not do it. For some of us, it might be the cage or roller coaster of a difficult family dynamic. Happens every time we get together for the holidays, running in those tight little dysfunctional circles. 
For others, it could be the cage of our fears. As we keep trying to to alleviate them in various ways. For others, it could be the cage of where we keep going to find life and keep discovering it fails to give it. The resurrection of Christ means we get to live in a bigger world now. And here Paul tells us in Colossians how. He says, if then you have been raised in Christ, seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things above. This is not a call to be otherworldly to somehow not live here. Rather, it is discovered that our life here can be connected to life in heaven, that the two spheres have been reunited in part. To seek the things above is to seek in particular a new world of freedom and wisdom in this life, but not in its cages. In James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, James uses that same phrase from above and says this, Who is wise and understanding among you? He is the person who knows the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. The person who is reunited, if you will, with Christ experiences the perfect freedom of wisdom like an atmospheric river that is, in a positive way, coming down upon us. It's as the roof of the cage has come off, the walls have fallen down, and we have options, we have freedom. That this is not the Truman Show, for those of you who know that movie, where the ceiling is just, that sky is just a painted ceiling that is still of this world. No. The walls have fallen down. We don't have to run in circles. We can bound across the new landscape of wisdom and life because we are raised with Jesus united with Jesus. He is free, and so we are free. I celebrated my birthday this year in a restaurant in L.A. I had never been to. My, my daughters took me to it. Um, you enter through a, 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 a little stone tunnel, and it seems to keep getting narrower and narrower, and you think you're going to drop into some kind of basement restaurant, you know. But actually, when you emerge from the tunnel, it's open to the sky, to the sun, to the moon, to the stars. That's a little bit like being raised with Christ. It's a little bit like living in the freedom of Jesus. We live in a world without a ceiling, where we are personally joined to the presence of Jesus, in the room now, with a ceiling off, by His Spirit, communing with Him, with our Abba as well. I may find myself at a gathering where suddenly the conversation degrades, where it begins to run in those small circles of human fallenness. And I remember that Jesus is free and that I am united to Jesus. And so I am free to take things in another direction. I may be stuck in a small circle of a relationship that is draining to me and this person. But I can remember that Jesus is free and I am united to Jesus, which means I am free to bound across the landscape, to run in another way with this person. Because Jesus is free, I am free. I may be caged in by my own fears, but I can remember that Jesus is free and I am united with Jesus, which means I am free to let him who is at God's right hand take me by the hand and lead me out from that cage. Now to look to wisdom and freedom with Jesus from above takes some retraining like that terrier, for we have been trained to run in the small circles of this world's way of doing things. But we are free to run in a new way, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the world. Because it is as we run across the landscape of Jesus' freedom that the world discovers it's in a cage. The church needs to be the church so that the world knows it's the world. Because of the resurrection, Jesus is completely free, sitting at the right hand of God, moving among us by his spirit, and we are united to him, and so today we too are free, and we rejoice in this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.